Hello everyone, I am Darren Langley and I work on Rocketpool, uh, which is a decentralized liquid staking protocol. So at Rocketpool, we've spent the last six years <laughs> building our liquid staking protocol. So today I'm going to take you through um, some lessons that we've learned along the way. So in this talk, we're going to break down what is a liquid staking protocol, what are some of the design choices, uh, what are the challenges of building a truly decentralized protocol? And then what are the opportunities? So, liquid staking. So, liquid staking is built on Ethereum's proof of stake system. Um, <laughs> a little tangent, I couldn't be more excited that Ethereum is now a proof of stake um, chain. And congratulations to all the researchers, uh, core developers, uh, and um, the dev and coordinators that have made it happen. It's fantastic. So when you stake, you are participating in Ethereum's proof of stake consensus. Why would you want to do that? So the most important thing is that you're contributing to the security of Ethereum. Uh, you also earn staking rewards for being a good node operator. So Ethereum has a couple of uh, kind of barriers. Oh, sorry, Ethereum staking has a couple of barriers. First of all, you need technical experience to run like a validating node. You also need a fixed 32 ETH per validator. Um, the staked ETH is actually uh, kind of naturally illiquid. Um, it exists on the beacon chain earning rewards, but you can't really use it for anything else, which is by design. Um, but most of the 32 ETH that you stake is not actually at risk. Um, except under the kind of most dire of consequences or situations. Uh, currently, it's also a one-way thing. So withdrawals are coming soon, um, but at the moment, it, you, you, you're staking and you're, that's it. So uh, the rewards from staking ETH come in two juicy flavors. The first one is consensus rewards, um, which comes from new ETH uh, inflation. Uh, and then uh, you get that by kind of performing your node operator duties. So that's a testing, being part of a sync committee, uh, and proposing blocks. As I said before, um, withdrawals aren't available at the moment, but they will be um, potentially after the Shanghai hard fork. Uh, execution, uh, the next type of uh, reward is the execution rewards. They come from users. So they uh, come from priority fees, which are the non-burnt part of a, a transaction fee. Um, and then uh, potentially MEV if you're extracting MEV. That's actually available today uh, and pretty much in real time. So how a staking protocol captures and then distributes those fees or those rewards um, is key to its design. So how does liquid staking work? Um, a liquid staker deposits any amount of ETH into the protocol, uh, and in return, they receive a liquid staking token. Um, the ETH that they deposited gets matched with the node operator. The node operator interacts with the protocol and deposits the ETH into, into the beacon chain. Node operators then earn rewards by being good node operators, and the liquid staking token accrues the value as yield. So that to unstake a liquid staker burns the liquid staking token for and gets back their ETH, or actually more ETH than they put in generally. Um, and you, you can either do it kind of in a primary mechanism or you can do it on a secondary market. So this is the very basic outline of how liquid staking works. Um, but as we'll see, every step has some design choices and trade-offs to, to be made. So why liquid staking? So it's kind of a, important to know why you're doing this. <laughs> what benefit does it serve? So it turns out that there are significant benefits to Ethereum as a whole. So liquid staking encourages greater participation um, that in turn provides greater security and decentralization. Uh, there's a little star there because it only uh, contributes to decentralization if the validator set or the node operators are decentralized and not just one entity. 
Uh, it, liquid staking facilitates unstaking through like a primary mechanism through the protocol itself um, or uh, on a secondary market. Uh, so it reduces validator churn. Um, it also fosters innovation and capital efficiency um, through the use of these liquid staking tokens in DeFi. Okay, so on this section, I'm going to focus on liquid token design, um, but there are some equally big design spaces on the node operator side, and, and some definitely some inter interesting challenges on that side as well. So first thing you realize when you're designing a liquid staking token is that node operators earn rewards at different rates. They may also be penalized, and in worst case scenarios, they can be slashed. So there's a couple of ways of handling this. The first way is to have a fungible token um, that shares rewards and losses across the entire protocol. Or you can have a non-fungible token where re rewards and losses are specific to each node operator or each validator. Then you can kind of have like, this hybrid of the two, um, although you've got to be careful you don't end up in the worst of both worlds. Each of these approaches have some different trade-offs and you have to kind of weigh up um, which ones. So the next one is safety. So there is ETH backing, you know, backing the liquid staking token. So what mechanisms are in place to protect that collateral? Ethereum's proof of stake system is a very forgiving protocol, but it is possible to lose your, your stake either partially or in like the extreme cases fully. Safety mechanisms built into the protocol need to account for things like slashing protection, uh, aligning incentives, uh, and general risk management. So rewards. So how are rewards delivered to token holders? How does the token reflect the yield that the protocol actually is producing? So generally, there are two approaches to this. There's rebasing and non-rebasing. So a rebasing token, um, its exchange rate is like a notional one-to-one -one with ETH but the quantity increases. So the token increases in quantity over time. That's how the yield uh, represents itself or gets delivered. With a non-rebasing token, the exchange rate increases, but the quantity is the same. The quantity stays constant. So the, the actual token increases in value over time. Um, and there's, some, there's definitely some kind of pros and cons of each of these, mainly that so with the rebasing token, it's very simple to understand. You're literally getting more of the token. Uh, but it's, it's extremely hard to integrate. So when the, if the quantity is changing all the time, that's not really compatible with most DeFi protocols. With a non-rebasing token, uh, it's, it's harder to understand. And if you go down that route, you'll um, spend most of your life uh, explaining to people what a non-rebasing token is. Um, but it is much easier to integrate. Uh, it, it's, it's just a standard ERC-20, and it's supported by most DeFi protocols. It actually turns out that an, a non-rebasing token is more tax efficient as well. So it depends on your jurisdiction. Um, but uh, with a rebasing token, you have like a taxable event every single day. Whereas with a non-rebasing token, you have a taxable event when you stake and when you unstake. So, liquidity. By tokenizing um, stake teeth, it can be traded on secondary markets such as exchanges. This provides liquidity for people to unstake their ETH. So the price you pay on secondary markets is dictated by the market. So it may pre present a liquidity discount or potentially a liquidity like premium. With large orders, there can also be slippage. And so staking protocols can offer like a if they can, offer a primary mechanism for unstaking ETH, so that it can allow um, um, uh, liquid staking token holders to actually swap back without the discount and without the slippage. Both of these mechanisms of unstaking kind of reduce uh, the need for validator churn. OK, so now you've got your token out in the wild. I mean, everyone's going crazy about it. Um, you need to start building utility. These come in the form of integrations with other DeFi protocols. So there's kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy of DeFi integrations. Um, it goes something like this. 
Uh, you integrate into wallets and explorers first. Uh, then you build up some liquidity. This is the bit that takes time, a lot of time, <laughs> to build up liquidity. You need uh, to get uh, breadth of liquidity and depth of liquidity. Um, that's important to kind of get to the next phases. You also need to get good liquidity on layer twos because you want to build up um, support in those, in those um, uh, ecosystems and also provide good UX for stakers. So then the next layer is oracles. So once, you, once you've got some liquidity, you can get oracles. The next one is DeFi protocols, particularly lending platforms, um, but also kind of options and I index uh, platforms and fixed income products and oh, loads of things. The last one is vaults. So vaults uh, are kind of like yield um, optimization um, platforms. They sit over top of loads of different um, uh, DeFi protocols and optimize that yield. So a decentralized staking protocol is a set of smart contracts that mediates between depositors and node operators, kind of escrows funds into the uh, Ethereum's proof of stake system and then back again. On withdrawal, the um, protocol transparently distributes those funds and ensures that each party receives what they expect. In short, withdrawal is where most of the action happens. OK, so it's at this point in the presentation that I need to give a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, the information on this slide is not final. Uh, the Capella specification is still being uh, kind of drafted. But at this point, this is what it looks like. So after the Shanghai hard fork, hopefully, um, consensus rewards uh, will be fully withdrawable or partially withdrawable. So fully withdrawn is a node operator initiated um, thing. So a node operator submits an exit message. They get processed by an exit, the beacon chain exit queue. They come into this withdrawable state, and then their funds are returned to a withdrawal, uh, a withdrawal credential. Uh, at that point, they are no longer validating. They're done as a validator. OK, that's full exit. With partial withdrawn, you're still validating. And in fact, this is like an automatic and ongoing process. So um, this, is, this essentially takes, skims the rewards um, off the top. So you have 32 ETH is your uh, kind of initial deposit, and then anything else you make um, on top of that will be kind of continually skimmed and sent to your withdrawal credential automatically by the, um, the beacon chain and the, the consensus clients. So withdrawal credentials are a key element of the Ethereum spec. Um, and they come in like two types. There's a 0x0, which is this BLS uh, signature credential, and 0x01, which is an Ethereum address that receives uh, the withdrawn funds. So most credentials in use today are 0x0. And that's because they were introduced first, and then much later, 0x01 came, uh, came ahead. So uh, in the current plan, 0x0 credentials, we need to be converted into a 0x01 um, to allow you to withdraw. And there'll be like this special uh, kind of migration process that'll, that'll facilitate that. So 0x01 is important because it facilitates the development of these uh, non-custodial staking protocols. Um, essentially because the 0x01 uh, address can be a smart contract. And so that smart contract can you know, take custody of funds. It can deposit them into the, um, the beacon chain, into the, into the deposit contract. Uh, and then it, when it withdraws, it can then distribute the, the funds to all the parties. So building a decentralized staking protocol is easy. No, not so much. <laughs> uh, there are significant challenges to developing a truly decentralized staking protocol. So first of all, permissionless. Being an open and public piece of infrastructure is key to a protocol's success. And it's, and it's also it's important for its alignment with Ethereum. Being permissionless is a, is a noble pursuit, and it's critical for Ethereum to, for retaining its credible neutrality. So being permissionless subsequently leads to trustless designs, which I believe are much more resilient in the long term. Like Ethereum itself, decentralized uh, staking protocols have to rely on a combination of cryptography and crypto economics to balance incentives and penalties, um, ensuring that the participants have aligned interests. But it is challenging. Um, but personally, this is, what it makes it this is what makes it interesting work. So scaling. Being a competitive market participant is important 
to ensure that Ethereum remains decentralized. Scaling a decentralized staking protocol is much harder than scaling a centralized provider. Uh, the two aren't even really comparable. A decentralized staking protocol has to rely on ingenuity to scale, but never lose sight of its kind of core value. A decentralized staking protocol is actually a community, um, a community of node operators who are passionate about securing Ethereum. Scaling is certainly a challenge, but it's, it is one that can be overcome. So reliance on oracles. So semi-trusted oracles are essential for decentralized staking protocols today. The consensus and execution layer are separate concepts, and they've only just been merged together. So oracles are required to aggregate and report validated performance information to the protocol smart contracts. There's actually an EIP that's being considered for um, Shanghai, and it's uh, EIP 4788. What it does is it adds access to the beacon chain state route uh, to the execution layer so that smart contracts can verify proofs about the beacon chain state. This is key to reducing the role of these semi-trusted oracles in de decentralized staking protocols, but it is important generally to combine those two concepts and allow innovation, um, to, um, particularly around validator status and finality uh, on the execution layer. So what are the opportunities? OK, so <laughs> this might be a bit counterintuitive, but Ethereum doesn't need more stake. It needs more individual node operators. So I, I believe this quote is from Superfizz. So uh, thanks, Fizz, if you're watching. Um, decentralized staking protocols have an opportunity to redress the balance. So by lowering the collateral requirement for node operators, there are more potential node operators available. By streamlining, setting up a node and running a node, it's easier to onboard new node operators. And if you lower the barrier to entry for spinning up a staking business built on top of a decentralized staking protocol, this allows a whole ecosystem of niche staking businesses to compete with large providers, more node operators. The more node operators we have, the more decentralized Ethereum is. Being a node operator is not as hard as you think. OK, so execution reward smoothing. So execution rewards, um, so the ones that come from uh, like transaction fees and potentially MEV, are extremely variable. This is because block proposers are chosen at random. So at this time, if you have like one validator, uh, you'll receive approximately five proposals per year um, on average, but you could get two or you could get 10. So this variability hits small node operators hard, but harder, actually hard, the hardest. Um, as a decentralized staking protocol, there's an opportunity to provide a reward smoothing pool that participants pool their proposals to achieve a consistent return rather than this highly variable return. So a smoothing pool actually levels the playing field for small node operators. They can kind of compete with the larger uh, node operators. This is uh, particularly uh, interesting when you think about MEV. MEV, uh, you can have, uh, on average, you can, you can earn you know, a, a decent amount from MEV, but every now and again, there'll be one of these lottery blocks um, the highest block, I think, that's recorded was a 100 ETH block. Um, that doesn't happen very often, uh, but that hence why it's a lottery block. But if you do get one of those blocks, then this is what the smoothing pool helps with. So I'm Darren Langley. Um, I'm from Rocket Pool. You can see, catch me on Twitter, and that's me. Thank you very much. Hi, 
My name is Benjamin with Rubicon.Finance. I wanted to ask, yeah. I understand rocket pool nodes are collateralized with RPL. How do you protect against uh, a tail risk scenario where if the price of RPL ETH is, is dropping, the uh, average collateralization of the network uh, starts to fall? And, and how can the protocol like uh, become robust uh, in light of basically uh, you know, relying on RPL ETH price to guarantee security? So in actual fact, uh, so RPL is used as a backstop. So the, the first thing that they, we, so with a, with a rocket pool node, uh, the node operator supplies 16 ETH and the liquid stakers supply 16 ETH. Um, and then the node operator also supplies some RPL, like it's minimum of 10%, so it's about 1.6 ETH. Um, and, uh, but the ETH is hit first. So uh, if, they, if they get slashed or um, if, if they, you know, if they're an absolutely terrible node operator, um, then it's actually the ETH that gets hit first. And then RPO is used as a backstop because you can actually lose a little bit more than 16 ETH in like, a, like the worst, worst case scenario. Yeah. Multi-part question. Okay. Uh, so first part, um, how hard is it to run a rocket pool node? Like, do you need to know Unix or can you just run a script and it installs everything? Second part. Uh, okay. yep. How many nodes can you run on one powerful PC? Right, cool. Okay, good question. Uh, so running a rocket pool node, you do need to know probably a little bit about um, Unix maybe. You can run it on different things. We don't necessarily support Windows, um, but you can run it on, on Linux, a Linux box. You do need to know a little bit about Linux. Uh, spinning up a rocket pool node is, I think, pretty much four commands. Um, uh, and, you're, and it's four commands and you've you've spun up a, a validating node. Um, so we've made it, we've streamlined the process. Uh, we have this thing called a smart node stack um, and it streamlines the process of, of actually spinning up a node. We connect everything up for you. We handle upgrades for you. It's, it's really easy. Um, the, other question, the other part of that question was, ah, right, that's right. Ah, that's, yeah, that's, that is a hard question to answer. So terminology wise, a node is like the box that's running it, uh, and then you have validators. So you can have a lot. <laughs> now, whether now whether you whether that's a good idea or not is is another is another matter. So you, what you would tend to do is you probably want to distribute across multiple nodes um, if if you had a lot. Um, but you you can run a lot. Um, different clients, different consensus clients, and different execution clients have different performance profiles. Um, but you know, yeah, you can run a lot on. I don't think we've, I don't think we've, um, we haven't modeled it, uh, but, it, but it is, it's in like the hundreds. Yeah, yeah. It's depending on the, it also depends on the box. If it's a powerful machine, then you could do that, yeah. Cool. Yeah, all right, awesome. Thank you very much, guys.